Welcome everyone to the Aging in Asia Ethical and Policy Issues in Healthy Aging and End-of-Life Care across the Asian Pacific region. Uh, my name is uh, Winston Tseng, and uh, I'm helping to organize along with Professor Duan Rong Chen at National Taiwan University, uh, this uh, global conference, uh, a webinar series uh, here hosted at UC Berkeley Institute for East Asian Studies and also with a School of Public Health. Um, really pleased that you are able to join us today for today's webinar as we think about issues in the U.S. in relation to Asia. Uh, that today we will talk about Taiwan and also as part of the series also uh, have uh, invited scholars from Japan, Korea, China, and Mongolia. Uh, and it's really my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Kevin O'Brien, the Ellen P. Bedford Professor of Asian Studies and Professor of Political Science and Director of Institute of East Asian Studies to give the welcome today. Kevin? Well, thank you very much. Um, it's also my pleasure to welcome you to this conference on aging in Asia. Um, or what's really become an ongoing roadshow for three consecutive Wednesday evenings or Thursday mornings for those of you in Asia. Uh, I really can hardly think of a more important topic uh, to examine as we watch so many nations in Asia and around the world, with some important exceptions, uh, become old quite rapidly. So what are the implications of this for the people themselves who are aging and also for social policies? and issues such as the end of life care. Now, in this era of coronavirus, uh, we're all thinking about the very old and the facilities where they receive full-time care or have access to skilled nursing more than we have ever before. And the ethical issues around this topic uh, are crucial too. I just heard, for example, a podcast about how not wearing masks and not closing the economy for long in the Netherlands uh, was related to societal views on euthanasia. So I look forward to hearing uh, what you learn and conclude after this series of webinars uh, and would like to thank Berkeley's Winston Sung and, and Chen Duan Rung from National Taiwan University for putting together uh, this timely and very fascinating event. And I'd also like to thank IES's uh, indefatigable Beverly Carey for providing staff support for it. Uh, even after she retired last July. Now, at this point uh, in our virtual events, I would normally say, I am sorry that you can't be with us here in Berkeley, but if any of you have been following the news, <laughs> yes. you know that the Bay Area is about the worst place in the world to be right now. <laughs> On Sunday at my house, it was 43 degrees centigrade. Wow. Uh, we've had over three weeks of days with very, very bad air. And today we have a sky uh, that looks apocalyptic. Uh, it's so orange and full of ash. And when you walk outside now, the ash falling like a snow is falling in many, many places. So this is one time where I think we really are doing better by having most of you virtual. And I only feel pity for those of you like me who are here in the Bay Area right now, uh, pinned in our house in three or four different ways, by the coronavirus, by the heat, by the fires, by the air. Uh, so this is one time uh, we really have done well. So without further ado, uh, let me turn the microphone back over to the organizers and, and let them get the show on the road as we dive into our first night uh, or morning for those of you in Asia of talks. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Ke Kevin. Um, you're really grateful um, for this conception of this uh, conference webinar series. Um, well, it's, uh, over a year and certainly more in the planning, really um, thinking about um, this important issue uh, globally um, as part of the, and the developments in Asia, certainly we really want to, you know, focus today's conference focusing on the developments in Asia and really, um, but in that context, I wanted to really think about kind of uh, in that global perspective, you know, 
what are some of the trends? What are some of the things this is as a basic really thinking about this larger context? Um, you know, globally, you know, around the world, you know, certainly Japan has some of the world's uh, longest life expectancy in the world. And certainly uh, Taiwan is also doing very well in relation. And we can see the US is very close, similar to Taiwan. And then certainly um, compared to other countries, uh, certainly some of the Asian countries are, are very similar. And, and I know for also for South Korea, it's about 82 in, and also for uh, Mongolia, it's about six, 70 years old. So the life expectancy at birth. So some of the trends um, globally. And uh, the population keeps rising, kind of projecting uh, the population. Um, and compared to uh, certainly Japan has the world's largest uh, Asian population proportionally. And uh, China has the largest number in terms of pure numbers of people 65 and older. And certainly um, thinking about the trends in Taiwan, the pr our presentation today, certainly the, you know, it's almost tripling in Taiwan over the next decade. So um, certainly these are um, interesting, you know, in different ways, you know, what is the burden of, to, to our nations uh, in Asia and also in the United States as we kind of um, transform our, our aging populations, you know, as I remember Professor Duan Rong Chen telling me, you know, now, you know, globally, this is the fastest growing population, 65 and older. Um, and, you know, thinking about this, you know, is as we had, there was a question we asked as, as part of a national study, you know, is aging as perceived as a major problem in your country? And in Japan, we could see it is. Uh, and certainly in the U.S., it's not so much. Um, in this study, unfortunately, it did not include Taiwan, but I would envision, imagine Taiwan would be more similar to China or Japan on that front of thinking about uh, aging as a major problem. And certainly that's why there has been a, a national effort that the government has put forth a major initiative the past few years uh, on aging 2.0 long, or long-term care 2.0 in Taiwan. And, you know, this was another, the survey also asked about how people felt about, you know, they feel confident about their standard of living as they age, would it be adequate? And um, in this case, the uh, China government, uh, people felt that they felt, you know, they, they will be adequate in old age. Um, and on the, other, on the other side, Russia was the lowest in this comparison across these countries. Um, and U.S. is also very confident, but um, I'm wondering, is it re real? This is kind of the attitude or perceptions. But um, these are some uh, examples comparing. Uh, and then Japan, um, in this case, not feel as competent, uh, competent. Japanese don't feel as confident about uh, they will have adequate standard of living as they age. But... And then one of these other questions is, that was asked in this larger report and study was, you know, who should bear the economic burden? So the one in red color bar is the government and the blue is the families and then the green is themselves. So comparing the different countries, um, some of the uh, Russia and China in this example talks about the government should bear the most burden like uh, many of these other countries as well. Um, and U.S. is the one that says the individual should bear the burden. So in this U.S. context of uh, aging and, uh, you know, it's really, it's an individualistic approach to uh, long-term care. Uh, and Japan is kind of in the middle, more, more balanced, as well as France, Germany and France in this example. And I wonder what the Taiwan perspective is. I'm looking forward to getting that, your perspectives, the, the, uh, the scholars that, who will be presenting today. Um, who should bear the responsibility for caring for older adults? And certainly today, uh, thinking about end of life. Um, and uh, as we evolve, certainly there has been a model of a, you know, social ecological model as we think about aging. And um, certainly 
oh, we are not alone. We, it's really uh, a systematic, but also, you know, community. It's also policy. You know, we really need to think of it uh, more broadly and how, how do we tackle this together, um, whether it's on the end of life's end or at the healthy aging side and extend in that. Um, next, I have really my pleasure to uh, introduce the three uh, panelists today, presenters today, um, Professor Xiaoyi Cheng, um, Professor Daniel Fu Cheng Tsai, and Professor Duan Rong Chen. And I will first introduce each of them. Uh, and then after the three introductions, the brief introductions, I will then welcome Professor Xiaoyi Cheng to first present. Okay. So, um, Professor Xiaoyi Cheng is an associate professor of Department of Family Medicine in the College of Medicine at National Taiwan University. Her research interest involves cancer screening, women's health, end of life care, and quality of dying. In recent years, she has founded Palliative Care Research Network in Taiwan and has been collaborating with Japan and Korea for cross-cultural studies. After comparing the physician perceived quality of dying in three countries, she has moved into a cohort, a project named East Asian Collaborative Study to elucidate the dying process. She is currently one of the members of the scientific committee of Asian Pacific Hospice Network and working mm -hmm. on Asian consensus on advanced care planning and protectives in Taiwan. And her presentation will be entitled Current Status of Advanced Care Planning in Taiwan. Next, I also wanted to introduce Professor Daniel Fu Cheng Tsai, who is a family physician and bioethicist. Um, he was formerly the head of the Department of Social Medicine and the founding professor of the Department of Research uh, Department and Research Institute of Medical Education and Bioethics at National Taiwan University College of Medicine. He is also jointly appointed as in the Department of Family Medicine, the Institute of Medical Device and Imaging, and the Graduate Institute of Clinical Medicine at College of Medicine. Um, he has an interest, his research focus areas include co cross-cultural bioethics, genetic ethics, transplantation ethics, clinical ethics, and ethics consultation, research ethics, research integrity, and medical ethics education. And Professor Tsai is also the director of the Center for Biomedical Ethics at National Taiwan University and has been uh, very uh, leading some of the efforts at a na national level, um, working with the Ministry of Education on a number of commission projects, uh, promoting education in science, technology, and society, um, national project in enhancing humanities and social science education and medical education, and currently the program for research ethics education, and also working with the Ministry of Health and Welfare, um, commissioning a project of building Taiwan Clinical Ethics Network, and also with the Ministry of Science and Technology, uh, commission a project to, to look at a LC office for a national research program for biopharmaceuticals. Next, I also wanted to introduce Professor Duan Rong Chen, a professor and director of Institute of Health Behaviors and Community Sciences in the College of Public Health at National Taiwan University. She is also the president of Population Association of Taiwan. Uh, as a fellow medical sociologist, uh, she received her PhD at Columbia University, and she has extensive research experiences using multi-level models, network analysis, propensity score matching, and GIS spatial models. Her primary research interest has focused on community neighborhood aspects of health inequality, sociology of obesity, and social network dynamics. Her research focus on social determinants of health and social network me mechanisms explain how health behaviors and knowledge are formed, copied, and transmitted with particular interest in issues on obesity. 
she's currently working on issues related to social inequality of active aging and dying. Um, really please welcome all three scholars from China. It's really such a pleasure for them, uh, for us to have them here today. Um, next, I wanted to uh, welcome Professor Xiao Yi Cheng to present. Um, please welcome her. Thank you, Dr. Cheng. Um, it's my pleasure to attend your uh, conference. And especially, I have to thank uh, Professor Duanrong Chen, who uh, is my uh, graduate school uh, professors. Okay, today uh, I'd like to talk on advanced status of advanced care planning in Taiwan because uh, this is one of the most uh, um, popular issues in end of life cares. And today I'd like to talk from the policy and academic and research and clinical perspectives. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about the Natural Death Act or the Hospice Palliative Care Act in Taiwan, which is the first in Asia. It was enacted 17 years ago, and basically it guarantees patients a right for do not resuscitation. Patient can decline to CPR and life treatments at terminal stage. And basically the act went through three times of amendment and basically on the issue of withhold and withdrawal, uh, I, which I believe Professor Daniel Tsai uh, will give uh, a talk uh, or, or more uh, elaborations later. And today I'd like to focus on uh, another law which was passed last year, which is the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, because there are some problems with Natural Death Act 17 years ago. So now we have this new law which guarantees more room for uh, the patients, okay? Uh, as you can see from, uh, from the slides, the lady sitting on my right uh, is uh, a former legislator, uh, Yang Yuxing. Uh, she suffers from um, uh, a typical muscular uh, dystrophy. Therefore, she advocates with her husband uh, for the passing of the law. So basically, the act is established uh, to uh, enhance respect for patients' autonomy, okay? And basically it indicated more broadly, uh, unlike the uh, Natural Death Act, which is basically for the terminally ill patients, especially the cancer patients. And this law is indicated for five clinical conditions. Uh, first of all, is that it's aimed for terminally ill patients or those with uh, in irreversibly comatose, or in vegetative state, or people suffering from terminal dementia, or diagnosed with incurable diseases. And basically, we advocate um, uh, advanced directive through the process of advanced care consultation. And what are the differences between these two laws, uh, the Natural Death Act and the Patient Right to Autonomy Act? And as far as I can see, there are three important differences. The first one is about uh, the subjects. Basically for the Natural Death Act is for the terminally ill patients and mainly the patients. And uh, for the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, and for people with five clinical conditions, as I mentioned earlier. So the subjects are broader. And when is the timing of uh, initiating the uh, uh, law? Basically, uh, the Natural Death Act is usually people sign when they are very, very ill. Sometimes they, they signed it in ER in, or in hospice. But the new law welcomes people to sign when they are healthy. So, you know, you have more room to consider about the patient autonomy. And the last one I think is quite important is that for the Natural Death Act, the surrogate could override the will of the patient, which means that uh, the surrogate can deny or veto all those um, uh, rights that patient uh, has declared, okay? But the new law guarantees that the surrogate couldn't override the wills of the patient. 
So the surrogate could only uh, monitor whether the will of the patient has been implemented in the right way. So these are the three important aspects that I think quite different. So how are we going to proceed this advanced care planning consultation? So in Taiwan, you have to at least uh, 20 years older, then uh, you have to make appointment. In order to make this appointment um, and to, uh, to process, you have to be uh, uh, mentally, um, you have to have mental capacity and to make this appointment. And uh, in Taiwan, there are over 100 ACP clinics at, uh, nationwide, okay? So on the day of uh, making ACP consultation, you have to uh, be present with at least one second degree relatives or um, invite uh, your surrogate and you don't have to if you don't want to, okay? So uh, about the medical team, uh, it's at least composed of three members, the physicians, the nurse, uh, the psychologist or social worker, okay? So what about the content of the ACP consultation? It's mainly focused on two issues. The first issue is on the life-sustaining treatment when you're terminally ill. And the second issue is on the topic of uh, artificial hydration or nutrition. And usually the consultation lasts for uh, at least an hour. So to, you know, to give plenty of time for the patients and to ask questions. Okay. And after they sign all the documents and it uh, will be put into a national health insurance card. And uh, so uh, whenever the patient goes to see the doctors and everyone, all the medical professionals will be able to see that the patient has signed the advanced directive. Okay. Just want to show you uh, what it looks like. And as I mentioned earlier, there are five clinical conditions which means that uh, when the patient, uh, some, if the patient meets one of the clinical conditions, then uh, it will be initiated. So take example, uh, when the patient becomes terminally ill, so uh, there is uh, an, an option, okay, about uh, 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 what's your preferred medical care um, uh, way. For example, like for life-sustaining treatment, there's a gradient of options. And ranging from, I don't want to get any life-sustaining treatment to, yes, I want to get uh, life-sustaining treatment for a certain period of time, okay? Or if I become comatous, I want my surrogate to decide for me. Two, I want everything. So it's a gradient of options, okay? And uh, uh, it's the same. Uh, the choices are the same for all the other five conditions. Yeah, the vegetative stage or terminal dementia or other diseases diagnosed as incurable. So this is what the advanced directive looks like. So it says that, uh, um, okay, the name of the patient has uh, been through the ACP consultation and has clearly understand what the law given um, the patient's right, the patient can receive or decline the life-sustaining treatment or artificial hydration and nutrition. And I think what's interesting is the last sentence. It says that I want my uh, relatives to respect my choices because this is one of the most important initiative of the law. Because in Taiwan, uh, it's very difficult for the patient to make the decisions. And this is what the ACP clinic looks like. In Taiwan, uh, there are uh, more than 100 ACP clinics almost in every hospital yeah, in the nation. And um, basically, it's not uh, covered under the national health insurance. You have to pay the clinics. And basically, uh, for each person, it costs around 120 US dollar. And if there's a second person present, it'll be reduced to uh, like 85 US dollars. So uh, it's kind of encouraging people to uh, engage in ACP earlier. And this is the actual site of engaging ACP. I think it's a couple and there's a sister who 
works as a second degree a relative. And I like to take a National Town University Hospital as an example. This is our team of ACP consultation. So uh, as of the end of August this year, uh, there has been a total of uh, 353 patients has been uh, being consulted. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a, um, a lar large number of females than males. And the majority of the patients are in the 60s. And interestingly, uh, you can see that uh, uh, most of the people, a majority of people are healthy. Only 36 uh, are considered to have a critical illness. So uh, the next step would be probably we, we would think how to promote ACP among terminally ill patients or those in need. Okay, uh, now I'd like to talk uh, some of my uh, research uh, which has been published or ongoing. And the first one uh, is uh, about the timing of initiating ACP because uh, all of you might aware that uh, it's a touchy issue to discuss uh, end-of-life issues, uh, especially in the Chinese or Taiwanese culture. Therefore, uh, but it's quite important because the doctors can get the tempo, the doctors uh, can know when it's appropriate timing to discuss with the patients. So we conducted a series of studies on the timing of initiating ACP. The first one is a collaboration with Kyoto University. Uh, uh, we, um, it's a uh, cross-cultural mixed method study in six medical centers, uh, both in Taiwan and in Japan. So uh, we designed three uh, scenarios. Uh, I think it's uh, um, lung cancer and stroke and myocardial stroke. Um, um, in patients, okay, three uh, scenarios and distributed uh, on the outpatient clinics for people with chronic illnesses. And we like to know when is appropriate timing from the patient's perspective and make some comparison. And of course, we like to know what are the factors that uh, affect their choices. And it's quite interesting. As you can see from here, in both Japan and Taiwan, it seems that a majority of patients, I think 70, more than 70% and more than 80% in Taiwan would like to discuss ACP when they are healthy. So this is really to our surprise. You know, people really want to discuss ACP when they're healthy and when they're you know, uh, relatively uh, uh, pre-frail, okay? And, uh, more Taiwanese would like to discuss ACP earlier than the Japanese. And uh, in our discussion, we think it's probably due to that uh, uh, in Taiwan, we have this Natural Death Act um, 17 years ago, okay? And um, uh, so basically more people would like to discuss it uh, uh, as uh, the consequence, okay? And uh, what are the factors that, that affect the Taiwanese people? to discuss ACP earlier, we find out that uh, um, as you're getting older, age, okay, age is an important factor, and also uh, the recognition toward uh, 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 hospice palliative care uh, act, and also the more so social support you have, the more you like to talk ACP earlier. So uh, this is a quite interesting study. But we also find out that probably one out of five people would not like to talk ACP early. Uh, probably there's some other reasons. And also we conduct some uh, qualitative study to explore uh, the reasoning. And uh, we're very uh, happy that uh, this paper has been published in uh, Palliative Medicine, the official journal of EAPC. Okay. The next study we'd like to do is to compare the preferences on the time of ACP between terminally ill cancer patients and their main family caregivers. Because this is a situation we're facing every day, okay? So the previous one is a comparison uh, between the two populations, uh, uh, Japanese people and Taiwanese people. But this one is a comparison of a diets, uh, terminally ill cancer patient and their family uh, caregivers. 
And this is a one center study conducted uh, at uh, NTUH. Okay. Um, to our surprise, originally we thought there might be a difference between the diets, but now it turns out to be that around 80% of the patients and the main caregiver think it's appropriate to initiate or conduct AC when they are healthy, when they're non-frail. This is really to our surprise because we thought that there might be a disconcordance or something, but the study shows there is a concordance. And what about uh, withdrawing the life-sustaining treatment? When is the appropriate timing to withdraw? And basically all the patients and family agree uh, it should be a withdrawal uh, when they're very ill, when they're bedridden, such as CPR and intubations and ventilations, uh, also hemodialysis. However, they think that the artificial nutrition, hydration, and antibiotics and blood transfusion shouldn't be stopped, even then we are, when they are very ill. Okay. And what about, uh, do you feel any uncomfortable when you discuss ACP personal at early stage? And a majority of the and um, uh, bank caregivers say no, they don't feel any discomfort. So which means that the, basically we can talk with the patients, okay? And a majority of them think that the discussion of ACP is very meaningful. So from this small study, uh, we know that the patient's preferences on the timing of initiating ACP and towards drawing life-sustaining treatments were found to be similar and consistent with their family caregivers. And we find out that a majority of the participants consider to have ACP earlier when patients were at non-frail stage. Meanwhile, patients' frail stage prognosis was identified as timing for life-sustaining treatment withdrawal, except for nutrition, hydration, antibiotics, or blood transfusion. So Taiwanese people's medical decision-making might be shaped differently by the cultural characteristics, such as relational stance of autonomy and social norm of filial piety. However, uh, we need to conduct more uh, qualitative study to understand the meaning behind the decision-making processes. Next, please. Okay. And last year, uh, under the sponsorship of Taiwan Medical Association, we held a uh, international conference on uh, the declaration of Taipei, declaration of ACP. And basically, we invited uh, five countries, um, basically my research partners. We invited uh, people from Japan, Korea, and Hong Kong, and um, uh, Singapore, and Indonesia, and these experts to draft a, a consensus on the ACP. Because we think uh, the Asian pers perspective of ACP is different from that uh, in the West. So uh, we uh, basically, the Taipei Declaration is on the roles and tasks of medical professionals. And uh, also it serves as a guidance of how to help the patients to conduct ACP in our cultural context. And it was published uh, in Journal of Palliative Medicine. Okay. And this year, uh, we're very uh, lucky and we're very honored to, uh, to be invited by Dr. Tasia Morita, an associate editor of JJCO, to write a review article on ACP in Asian cultures. In this article, we basically uh, review all the Asian perspectives in terms of ACP, and uh, we uh, 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 analyze from uh, cultural, from religious, and also from um, a clinical um, and research perspectives. And uh, it was, I think it was published last month. So in summary, uh, ACP in Taiwan is growing prosperously. And from policy perspective, we have this Patient Right to Autonomy Act, which actually uh, broaden or deepen or given patient more rights in terms of uh, uh, end of life decisions, okay? And clinically, and it's growing fast that the uh, almost all hospitals have set up the ACP clinics to uh, encourage uh, people to engage ACP 
earlier. And academically, we've conducted several uh, domestic or international study uh, to, um, to understand uh, it from the cultural perspectives. And basically we find out that both in Japan and Taiwan, people would like to talk ACP earlier uh, than we thought. So basically the medical professionals can encourage patients to discuss it earlier, okay? And we also find out this special feature in Asia, which is the relational autonomy, that uh, the patient, usually their decision is influenced by the family. So what about uh, the future or goals? And as I pointed out earlier, we find out at present stages, the ACP is basically for the healthy people. However, uh, those with terminal illness are those in great need. Therefore, uh, I'm very, very lucky to have passed uh, a, um, a grant. I've got a grant from uh, the Ministry of Science and Technology. It's a three-year trial to see if uh, uh, it's a comparative uh, study on the ACP brochure versus ACP planning brochure plus educational module to evaluate the ACP completion rate among cancer patients. And we'd like to know what are the related barriers. Because if we can prove that, uh, you know, by using some kind of educational module to encourage the signing of, or completion of AD, we would like to put it as a, um, a treatment uh, uh, standard during uh, the treatment, the cancer patient treatment, it would be much better to early to kind of remind them uh, to uh, assign advanced directive uh, during their uh, uh, illness trajectory. Okay, and um, in addition, we're working on uh, the Asi Asian ACP Delphi, which is like because uh, uh, we know that the ACP is different in Asia uh, from that of the West. So we like to make, uh, it's like uh, ACP in the Asian uh, way. So I think it's undergoing, the study is undergoing. And also we have to care about uh, the ACP the, under the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's an uh, emerging issue everyone is facing. I think that's about my presentation. And thank you very much. And all the questions and feedbacks are welcome. Thank you. Uh, in your study, did you see any difference between the percentage of discussion ACP and percentage of those finally making uh, the decision? Okay. Um, so I think, are you talking about the um, uh, DIAS study, uh, the ACP with terminally ill cancer patients and the family caregivers? Uh, basically, uh, what, what we found from the study is that there's a concordance, there's a high majority of concordance uh, between the patients and the family. So that's why we think there's a relational autonomy issue in our study. Okay. Okay. How did the patient autonomy law become legal? Did everyone vote on it? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually it was brought up by our legis um, by one of the legislators, uh, Dr. Yang Yuxi, as I show you, uh, in my presentation, and it was voted by the legislative members, and it, it uh, was uh, it became uh, put into effect last year from January six. Okay. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much uh, for your, your presentation, presentation, Professor, Professor Chen. Chen. Uh, next, I want to welcome, welcome Professor Daniel Tsai on his presentation. presentation. Ethical legal challenges in withdrawing life sustaining treatment from non terminal patients in the legislation of the, the Patient Right to Autonomy Act in Taiwan. Please welcome him. Uh, thank you, Winston. Can everybody see me? Uh, I have made some pre-recording, so I will uh, proceed into this uh, display of this pre-recording. Uh, so thank you, Kavli. Uh, my topic today it's is ethical legal challenge in withdrawing life sustained treatment from non-terminal patient, patient by two uh, To give you a little bit background on my topic, so achieving a good death has been regarded as one of the five blessings in traditional Chinese culture. 
I said, Mark and Western medicine has been practiced over, and the practice of cardio pulmonary resuscitation, life sustaining treatment, and ICUK uh, at end of life. Actually, it has changed a lot our uh, final stage of life. And it even constituted a new death manual of dying ritual. And the National Health Insurance Service in Taiwan, since 1995, covered all these costs. So, the last blessing with death became not always easy to realize for many who accept end of life care in contemporary hospitals. Can you increase the volume? And the legal framework for end of life care in Taiwan uh, we refer to two. Firstly, the Hospice and Palliative Care Act. And this, this is in fact in 2000. And it applied to all patients uh, in terminal illness. And second, uh, the Patient Right to Autonomy Act. This is 2019. And this law is for competent patients decisions. Uh, thanks to the hospice and palliative care movement in Taiwan, the acceptance of DNA rate increased uh, remarkably. For example, uh, based on my research and my colleague, we know that in 2001, the DNA rate is about 60%. And after 10 years, uh, this reached to 73.3% in 2011. And in this presentation, I would like to address the issue of withdrawing life sustaining pain, sustaining treatment in non terminal competent patients and non terminal incompetent patients. So, firstly, I have to present a case of ethics consultation. Uh, this is a 75 year old female lady. She had familiar amyloid poly polyneuropathies. And for years, uh, her disease progressed. And now she became paralyzed with her neck and must rely on NG tube feeding uh, for living. And in January 2016, she was admitted because of pneumonia and respiratory failure, and she needed a BiPAP ventilation. However, the winning is unsuccessful, unsuccessful and she signed the NR. And she is consciousness clear and she refused tracheostomy. And today, she requests for withdrawing BiPAP and refuse further curative treatment. Family could accept such decisions. However, the care team uh, was worried whether this is ethical or legal. Based on the new law uh, announced uh, in 2015 and in effect in 2019, it states that person with full disposition capacity may make the advanced decision uh, to accept or refuse LST or artificial nutrition and hydration under specific conditions. Mm -hmm. And this law in Article 40 defines the five conditions. First, terminal ill, irreversible coma, PVS, suffering from severe dementia, mm -hmm. and in conditions or suffering are unbearable, incurable, and no treatment option available. So this law defines five conditions that allow patients to refuse treatment and nutrition. So I gave my consultation opinion uh, in response to this uh, request. So first, patient has expressed clear wishes for refusing ventilation treatment in tracheostomy and signed DNR, which was also accepted by her families. The decision is ethically and legally valid and should be respected. Second, Competent patient can make informed choices based on their value and judgment to refuse treatment provided by doctors. RST should not be forced upon them against their wishes. And this is irrelevant to whether the patient is terminal ill and needs not employ uh, Hospice and Palliative Care Act. Third, according to the ATS guideline 1991, Based on the ethical principle of autonomy or self-determination, physician and other health care providers have responsibility to respect patient autonomy while by withholding or withdrawing any life-sustaining therapy as requested by an informed and capable patient. Fourth, however, 
The patient may be inadequately informed, emotionally unstable, may change their mind, cannot really base on their value to make decisions. All these should be considered and evaluated. So by social worker or psychological uh, consultation to help communication and assessment and allowing them enough time for reconsideration are necessary for clarifying uh, their genuine wishes. And then, even though this new law passed uh, uh, and advanced directive actually uh, uh, has legal definition and protection, yet the law will be effective only after January 2019. So at present time, it may not be applicable. However, competent patient can refuse treatment is a self-evident right. And then, if the patient's physical, psychological, and mental capacity status has been evaluated, and external forces or internal factors which might influence uh, her voluntariness have been excluded, then her refusal of treatment should be respected. Please invite the patient to sign on the advanced directive, DNA order, a feed of it for refusing BIPAP, which will give certain legal protection for our medical staff. So please also refer to uh, the NTU guideline for withdrawing life sustaining treatment to ensure a good clinical practice, as well as pursuing a peaceful ending for the patient, family, and healthcare team. And thank you for your consultation and you're welcome to further contact me. So for this case, uh, follow up, the patient signed this document at the witness of her family, and then the BIPAP and NG tube were removed uh, on uh, April 9th, 2016. Uh, and palliative care, treatment, symptom management were provided. The patient passed away peacefully four days later uh, with her family surrounding her. So these are the four we have uh, designed and created uh, by the Clinical Ethics Committee and now uh, being used in the hospital settings. So this is the AD for palliative care, and this is the DNR form, and this is the treatment refusal a fit of it, and uh, also you can refuse endotracheal tube uh, by signing this a fit of it. And then for withdrawing life sustaining treatment, uh, these are the checklist guidelines uh, from the beginning discussion period, from the withdrawing uh, uh, timing and process, and after the withdrawal, the post care. So with this, I think we provide a better care for uh, competent, uh, even non-terminal patients. But we know there are legal vacuum zone, okay? So we see that uh, in 2000, we have Hospice Palliative Care Act uh, for patient with terminal illness. And the new law in 2019, we provide a competent patient with five medical conditions, the right to refuse uh, treatment. But if the patient is incompetent and non-terminal, and we know that uh, there's little law uh, can help them. So we refer to the UK and US court cases of withdrawing life-sustaining treatment from previous situations. So the Quinlan case in one, uh, 1976, this is most famous. So this is withdrawal of ventilator. And uh, in UK, uh, 1989, Tony Blank case, and Nancy Cruz in 1990, and Terry Shavo in 2005 in the US. Uh, these cases refer to withdrawing fluid and nutrition support and H2 feeding. So I'd like to refer to the Tony Blank case. So Tony Blaine was uh, PVS because of the uh, disasters uh, at the age of 17. And uh, the hospital and with her, uh, his parents applied for a court order, allowing him to die with dignity. So this is the first patient in English legal history to be allowed to die by the court uh, through withdrawal of uh, life prolonging treatment, including fluid and nutrition. So, uh, the hospital uh, applied to the court uh, for a declaration to effect that they can discontinue all RST. Uh, the sub sub subsequent treatment uh, is enabling to end his life in dignity and free from pain and suffering. And the death is a natural cause and no one should be uh, held liable 
uh, by criminal or civil charges. So the declaration was granted uh, because the court judged that it was in the patient's best interest for treatment to be withheld, and doing so is of good medical practice. However, this case brings to uh, uh, Supreme Court, okay, uh, the Court of Appeal, uh, invite expert, and also make the same uh, witness that this is of good medical practice, and withdraw the NG tube and artificial nutrition uh, is allowed because this brings no benefit to the patient. Nearly 30 years later, you might have noticed in this news as me, okay? This is in 2017 September. Uh, there's a new uh, case go to the court, and the court ruling uh, uh, say that uh, there's no more court ruling needed to withdraw care, okay? So legal permission will no longer be required to end care for PBS patients. Uh, Justice Jackson rule that uh, based on a case uh, go to him, that uh, the patient suffered from degenerative illness for 14 years, and, and he has been uh, in uh, no sign of awareness for 18 months. So Justice Jackson agreed uh, with her family and doctors that withdrawing nutrition from her would be in her best interest. And this actually referred to Tony Blank case, okay, in 1989. And this time, uh, the court actually uh, further uh, defined that uh, in the future, this case, you no longer need a court judgment, okay? So uh, it is reported that when all parties, family, hospital, and treating doctors are agreed on what uh, someone would have wanted for their care, it seems absurd to require a costly court process to, to confirm uh, this. So by BBC research, they, uh, they knew that uh, there are more than 100 patients in England and Wales, okay, who are in PPS or minimally conscious status. So this judgment uh, actually was uh, challenged and go to uh, Supreme Court. So uh, nearly one year later uh, from the Supreme Court, uh, actually backed this decision. So legal permission will no longer be needed to withdraw treatment from patient in PVS. And the court need not be involved in these sort of cases, so long as doctor and family are in agreement and it is in the best interest of the patient. So they did back uh, from uh, Supreme Court. Uh, uh, think that an agreement between family and doctors was sufficient safeguarding to ensure public confidence. And when there are case uh, of doubt, so she advised you can still come to the court for judgment. So now we come back to Taiwan, okay. Uh, Taiwan has very similar cases and the most famous one is Miss Wang Xiaoming, okay. Uh, she was at uh, the age of 18, uh, 17, uh, because of a traffic accident became PVS. And she, uh, she was in bed for 47 years taking care of uh, her uh, very well. Her uh, loving father and moms uh, both uh, gradually uh, uh, die of, uh, because of die, dying of the cancer uh, uh, one by one. And she was continued to taking care of by uh, her sisters for 47 years. Finally, uh, she died uh, in March 2010. So this will be the Next challenge, okay, in Taiwan uh, for annual flood cares. It is estimated uh, maybe thousands, uh, even tens of thousands of cases who uh, are uh, supported by uh, artificial nutrition. Uh, but the law, uh, current two law, cannot help them uh, because uh, they have already become incompetent and they are in, in non-terminal status. So you can see that this is the local newspaper, okay, uh, reporting that uh, many people actually uh, cannot uh, find a way out. So the Minister of Health and Welfare, okay, they discuss, uh, communicate, communicated, okay, and they actually think that uh, we should consider an opening, a legal exit for PPF station to discontinue RST. 
and it, and, and this uh, report said that uh, it is estimated that there are more than 200 patients uh, with this kind of condition. So come to my uh, quick conclusion. Firstly, the two law in Taiwan, even though they are both their first kind in Asia, uh, cannot really help uh, this patient uh, because they are neither terminally ill uh, nor competent. And we actually in need of a new ethical legal framework and process. Considering the social, cultural, and religious factor in Taiwan, so for terminating RST from non-terminal and incompetent patients will be our next challenge. So this concludes my presentation, and I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Tsai. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to use chat or um, to ask your question. Um, I, I have one question for you, Professor Tsai. Um, as this is evolving and kind of um, changing in Taiwan. How are these issues also, um, these laws also, are these also changing in other Asian countries? Based on your understanding, how is, is it also uh, other Asian countries are facing some issues and these uh, laws are also have been changing? Uh, thank you, Winston. <clears throat> uh, I will firstly uh, respond to the question. And I know that we have some participants from other Asian countries. Uh, maybe they can <clears throat> help uh, explaining their situation. Uh, for the Hospice and Political Care Act, uh, I know that uh, some uh, other Asian country like uh, South Korea, and maybe not Japan, but uh, South Korea, they have uh, uh, some very similar law. And uh, for the law concerning to advanced care planning, <clears throat> uh, in Hong Kong, they actually have uh, not law, but some kind of directive, okay, giving the clinician, uh, they can, uh, some guidance, uh, how to respect the advanced care planning and their decisions in terms of the, the terminal care. But uh, I'm not sure about Singapore, okay, uh, or, or uh, maybe uh, uh, Southeast Asia, but uh, concerning the advanced care planning law in Taiwan, uh, which is equivalent to the U.S. Uh, Patient uh, Cell T Determination Act, I, I think Taiwan has this law is the first one in, uh, in these Asia countries. So that is my uh, understanding of the legal uh, status in some Asia countries. There is another question. Um, it's asking, um, do you have statistics of how many patients were thought to be in a vegetative state and, and who health recovered and reversed from such a state? Uh, yes, I think uh, I don't have exactly data, but well, we, we heard about news like that from time to time. Okay, maybe after a few years of bedridden and uh, miraculously uh, some patient regained consciousness and, uh, and he knows he, every, everything happened uh, surrounding him and then uh, he's happy to, to come back. So we know that there's a neurological condition called a lock-in syndrome, okay? uh, meaning that patient cannot communicate, but actually he is aware of uh, uh, what happens. Uh, his perception is okay, but only the communication function has been uh, uh, inf inferenced. So yes, it, it is always necessary to be sure. So uh, based on our uh, 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 practice guideline concerning that there's five clinical condition, especially the second, third, and the fourth one, referring to uh, severe dementia or uh, permanent vegetative status. So certain period of time of observing and evaluating is important, okay? If it is an acute condition, it will take six months for you, a neurologist, <clears throat> to really to make this diagnosis. If that is a chronic uh, degenerative condition, it will take at least three months of observation to uh, confirm this diagnosis, such as a severe dementia or irreversible coma, comatose status. Uh, Thank you so much um, for your time. We will re leave the remaining questions at the end. Um, next, I wanted to uh, welcome Professor Duan Rong Chen, 
who will be presenting about gender difference and discordance of perceived end of life decisions on behalf of parent, spouse, and self. Would you please welcome her? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Zhuang Rong Chen. I'm from uh, National Taiwan University. Uh, so now I'm uh, going to share my screen. Okay, today uh, I'm going, uh, I'm, uh, I want to thank Dr. Uh, Xiao Yi and uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel. And they are my uh, uh, very uh, good friends. And they do a very uh, beautiful presentation about uh, end of life care in Taiwan from clinical and uh, uh, ethical perspective. And today I'm going to uh, share with you some of the uh, uh, findings about uh, how gender differences uh, in response to uh, the uh, Patient Autonomy Right Act. Uh, the, uh, the, the act has been uh, mentioned uh, in previous presentation and then how the discordance of the uh, perceived end of a uh, uh, life uh, decision on behalf of parents, spouse, and the self. Uh, so uh, the background is, <clears throat> as Taiwan Training for the Aging Society, elderly parents often need adult children to make end of life uh, decisions as they are approaching the end of life. However, the moral dilemma and anxiety of methylene surrogates has been constantly reported. Such a dilemma and sometimes tragedy has led to shift in practice and policy to allow competent adults to specify in advance how they want to be treated with the goal of respect for autonomy in the period of decisional incapacity. So uh, after a long history of, uh, 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 you know, end life uh, policy, uh, uh, on January 6, uh, 2019, the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, as the PAA, finally came into force in Taiwan. So this is the first patient law uh, in Asia to protect patients' right to be a, uh, to have a natural death. Here, uh, December uh, 2019, uh, there were uh, uh, 11,000 signatures of uh, AD, and the rate of uh, completion of AD is still very low. Many people may not be aware of the PAA, and the patient actually, in fact, they may not be aware of the treatment they want, they may need in the future, and the choices uh, might, might change. So the problem uh, uh, arises is that low rate of AD creates uh, a great deal of uncertainty about who will be the surrogate decision makers for people approaching uh, the end of life. And in most Asia society, some always the one, the person to decide, and daughters sometimes are the one to care for parents. And the uh, opinion of daughter often left unrecognized if they no longer live with or care for their parents. So we believe gender differences might exist with respect to the attitude toward the PAA and then to what type of uh, uh, LSD, life-sustaining treatment, they will choose on behalf of parents, spouse, or for themselves. Because the literature has, has uh, uh, indicated that in U.S. population, uh, surrogate uh, were normally daughters, uh, over 60%. However, in Taiwan, surrogates were normally sons, and then daughters, and then spouses. And in Japan, female surrogates were more likely to change the preference from CPR to DNA, DNR than were male surrogates. So we believe uh, end-of-life decision on behalf of parents and spouse might be affected by socialized uh, gender role. So uh, the ob objectives of this uh, uh, empirical study is to explore uh, gender differences in response to the newly legislated PAA, uh, Patient Autonomy Right Act, and to examine the extent to which gender affects hypothetical decisions made for themselves 
and on behalf of others, including parents and spouses, in end of life uh, context. And we used a model of uh, surrogate decision making uh, from Chuni and uh, Ziegler uh, uh, pub uh, published an uh, article in 2015, and they used uh, uh, four uh, type of uh, perspectives to explain uh, how surrogate uh, decision makers uh, make decision. Uh, the first, the first two egocentric projectives is is uh, is more about uh, what do I do, what would I do, and the the, the, the last two benevolent and simulated is about uh, what the patient should do or what the patient would do in such a circumstance, and. For this uh, uh, two type of a perspective, uh, uh, there's a decision rule uh, 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 to describe how people might take uh, take uh, uh, each uh, one of these uh, uh, perspective. Uh, one the intent, intent, the intention of the decision maker in choosing a perspective. If the pay, if the maker this uh, intent to use egocentric, and then they use egocentric perspective. And second one is empathy. Uh, more empathetic people are likely to understand that other people might have different perspective than, than, than themselves, so are likely to believe a uh, simulated uh, perspective. And significance, decision with profound consequences are more likely to be weighed toward the simulated uh, perspective or benevolence perspective. Uh, accountability, the likelihood that the surrogate will be required to explain and be held accountable for his or her decision, they are more likely to be malevolent uh, perspective. Uh, collaboration, the, really, the relationship between the decision maker and the recip uh, recipient. Uh, surrogates who are closer to the recipient are likely to behave in a, a simulated perspective. Okay, so this uh, uh, framework uh, may help me to uh, interpret uh, the finding uh, in our study. So the data and the method, uh, the, the study conduct a face-to-face -face interview uh, with 80 family members of a patient in intensive care unit, surgical and the general wards of an academic medical center from March, uh, uh, 2019 to December uh, 2019. So a total of 100 uh, questionnaire were self-administrated self and 82 were interviewed successfully. Uh, however, there's two questionnaire are invalid. So it result a 80 valid questionnaire. The criteria for, uh, for us to include the respondents for interview were family member of the inpatient who had been hospitalized for 48 hours or more, and the person who had visited the patient more than twice during the hospitalization, and the person who had to uh, over 20 years old and had the ability to answer clearly, and the person who are related to the uh, inpatient by law or by uh, blood. And uh, the major uh, are, we used a uh, self-administrative questionnaire, and this questionnaire will cover three parts. One is general attitude toward the PAA, and the second one is uh, a perceived non-medical factor if they agree to withdraw LSD and the end of life uh, situation. And the third is perceived emergency LSD if uh, they were with uh, severe dementia for self or on behalf of parents and their spouses. The five emergency LSD uh, create a scenario, ask uh, a respondent to choose uh, whether uh, it's uh, more approaching death or maintaining serious compromised quality of life. And the five emergency LSD uh, are uh, two tuber feeding if the severe dementia prevents from eating and dialysis. 
uh, or be in, in, in to be intubated uh, ventilator if they cannot uh, breathe. And undergoing a uh, tracheotomy if being uh, intubated for a month and the survival is not possible without a ventilator. Uh, the last one, the CPR, if the uh, heart stopped due to the end stage of severe dementia. And the respondent will reply with an answer format of one strongly disagree to five strongly disagree, uh, uh, indicate the extent to which they agree with the statements of surveyed. So this is a look at the result. Uh, uh, this is a, a sample distribution of those uh, eight, 80 uh, respondents. Uh, you, can, you can see uh, a slightly more uh, respondents are female and 80%, uh, uh, more than 80% has an education of a college and the graduate uh, school. And most of them live in uh, Taipei area and uh, 80% uh, of them uh, are employed, full-time uh, full employed. Okay. So uh, let's see, uh, first one, awareness or knowledge of the PAA. Uh, as you can see, uh, over half the respondents are or not aware of the PAA uh, has been uh, legislated. Uh, and the, the percentage of men report aware of the PAA is significantly uh, higher than that of a woman. And we also uh, asked them uh, about uh, the knowledge of PAA. And we used, uh, used 10 items. And as you can see, uh, men uh, report uh, less correct, correct uh, knowledge of the PAA than uh, that of a woman. So uh, then we go to see the uh, general attitude toward the PAA uh, with the instrument of nine items, we come about three factors. Uh, one uh, factor uh, is uh, senses of uh, abandonment and the compromised care, including four items, such as uh, uh, with the PAA, uh, it's like basically waiting to die, um, or with the PAA, I feel insecure about my medical treatment in the future, or with the PAA, quality of care will not be guaranteed. Okay, uh, for the factor two, uh, it's like a support for patient autonomy. It uh, goes like a PAA can reduce the pressure uh, on family member to make decision. And PAA uh, make how I wish to be medical treated to be respect. The, the, last, the, the third factor is the PAA is a public good, uh, uh, including three items, uh, such as with the PAA, uh, Futile medical care can be reduced. Uh, with the PAA, healthcare provider will be protected from lawsuit while uh, treating me as, uh, as I, I wish to be medical treated. And the last, with the PAA, waste in medical resource can be reduced. So we go to see uh, gender differences uh, in terms of the three dimensions of attitude toward PAA. As you can see, on the uh, uh, screen, uh, these three uh, gender differences uh, exist in these three dimensions of the general attitude toward the PAA. And uh, men uh, present strong agreement with uh, uh, factor one, uh, sense of abandonment and the compromise care. But women uh, present a stronger uh, agreement with the uh, support for patient autonomy and also uh, present stronger agreement with uh, PAA is a uh, public good. So if we look at uh, each item of this uh, uh, different factor, uh, you can see clearly the where's uh, the gender difference uh, that lies. Uh, in a, Better one, sense of abandonment and the compromised care. Uh, you can see uh, men uh, mainly pre uh, present stronger agreement with the, the statement that I am basically waiting to die with the PAA. And men also present a stronger agreement with the statement that my quality of care 
will not be guaranteed. Okay, uh, this uh, this two item reach uh, statistical uh, significance. For the factor two, support for patient autonomy, and uh, 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 women present a stronger agreement uh, as a PAA can make how I wish to be medical treated to be respect. Uh, and for the factor three, uh, uh, as you can see, three items of factor three all, uh, show a strong gender differences. Uh, women, tend to agree, uh, present stronger agree that uh, fetal mental care can be reduced or, you know, a healthcare provider will be protected from those and the uh, waste in medical resource can be reduced. Okay, so uh, let's go to uh, uh, the third uh, topic is perceived non-medical factor if they uh, withdraw LSD at the end of life context. And we asked the respondent uh, the following statement. Uh, when you were at the end of a disease, eventually you cannot get any better. Uh, you will probably need to make a decision of whether using life sustaining uh, treatment when uh, emergency occur. In addition to listen to the opinion of our medical staff, what would you consider important for your decision? And then we asked them to rent the, to rent the first three important factor. And the result also show uh, uh, interesting uh, gender differences. Uh, for men, uh, uh, most men rent uh, the most important factor uh, for them to uh, withhold uh, LSD at the end of life is to consider if they do it and the condition will cause future financial burden. But for women, uh, uh, the reason will be if that if they if they cannot uh, uh, still live independently, uh, they will consider withdrawing LSD at the end of life. And there are two other uh, two uh, uh, items here um, uh, for me are very interesting is to to consider the influence of a religion on um, uh, making decision with. Uh, 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 about withholding LSD, uh, none of the women consider that is a uh, uh, very important factor. But however, men, uh, about 10% of men, consider the, the, region, the, the religion is a very important factor for them to make a decision about LSD. And also, suggestion and the thought of um, family uh, are, are also uh, uh, put more weight um, men's uh, uh, decision about withdrawing LSD if they were at the end of uh, life. Okay, and then uh, uh, to our last uh, uh, scenario is perceived emergency LSD for themselves and the parents or, or on behalf of parent and the spouse if they're living with uh, severe dementia. So there is a, a, a kind of a choose between approaching death or maintaining serious compromised quality of life. Uh, as you can see uh, in this slide, uh, men gender differences are, are very, uh, are, are very uh, strong uh, when they choose uh, for themselves uh, if they with a severe dementia. Uh, as, uh, so. You can see men tend to uh, use, uh, choose um, uh, emergency LSD even with the uh, compromised uh, uh, quality of life with a, uh, severe dementia. So uh, now it's uh, about on behalf of parents. Uh, so the, this, this uh, slide shows the differences between making uh, the decision for themselves or and uh, making this uh, decision on behalf of parents. So as you can see uh, on the uh, chart that um, both gender, uh, they want to do more for parents than for themselves. Uh, it, it meaning that uh, they would avoid death for their parents, uh, even with a uh, serious compromised quality of life. 
and for them, for themselves, they would rather choose, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not uh, choose, uh, choosing uh, death rather than maintaining uh, serious compromise quality of our, our life. But there is one interesting thing I want to bring your attention to is the last one. Uh, the last one uh, go, uh, is the statement that if uh, uh, the parent uh, uh, heart stopped due to the end of dementia, would you uh, want to uh, undergo a, a CPR? For, for, for men, they still want to uh, have a CPR for their parents than for themselves. But for women, uh, they, uh, they don't want it for their parents and also for themselves. So the difference is almost uh, uh, close to zero. And the last one is about uh, making decisions on behalf of a spouse. And uh, then the, I believe there's a very interesting uh, phenomenon here is that for men, uh, almost there's no uh, difference uh, between self and the spouse. Um, meaning that uh, for men, when they choose uh, uh, life, uh, you know, LSD, uh, uh, they choose, uh, there's no difference between they choose for themselves or choose for their spouses. However, for women, uh, they, will, they will want to do more for their spouse. Uh, so it's, it suggests that for women uh, who may want to be, uh, uh, who, who would do more for their spouse to avoid uh, death, even with uh, serious compromised quality of life uh, for spouse. Okay, so it goes to our discussion. Uh, the first one, uh, the, the uh, small empirical result has uh, uh, several interesting findings. First one is uh, men perceive the PAA as an indication of patient be abandoned and their care compromised. However, women had a more positive attitude toward the idea of patient right to autonomy. And they perceive the PAA as a valuable and for the public good. We believe it might be due to the fact that the men uh, lack of awareness uh, of the PAA and also their knowledge of the PAA uh, are not uh, 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 correct. And second uh, finding is uh, men consider family and financial burden most important if they uh, have to decide to withdraw LSD uh, and the end of uh, uh, life uh, uh, context. However, uh, women value the livelihood of living independently when they consider uh, L uh, withdrawing our SD uh, and the end of life uh, context. So compared to a man and a woman, uh, men tend to prefer to have uh, LSD uh, in end of, uh, in end of life uh, context for themselves and even more on behalf of their parents as compared to uh, uh, women do. So with the severe dementia scenario, the risk preference involves choosing between approaching death uh, or uh, approaching a serious compromised quality of life. Uh, both gender will tend to uh, avoid a serious compromised uh, quality of life uh, for themselves. However, they uh, want to avoid approaching deaths for their parents. And men particularly would avoid risk of parents' deaths by doing CPR, even the heart stopped due to the severe uh, dementia uh, of their parents. And the self-order differences disappear when men choosing LSD on behalf of their uh, spouses. And uh, however, women tend to do more to avoid uh, approaching death for their spouses than, uh, than for themselves. So the conclusion will be, uh, we, we believe the principle of accountability might provide guidance to interpret the finding of self-other differences. Because in Asian society, adult children as surrogate tend to conform the social norm of filial piety 
Xiao Shen, the the principal. So they need to account for their decision on behalf of uh, uh, parents to society or to other family member. The same logic might apply to uh, you know husband and the wife uh, uh, situation, and wife, uh, not husband. They uh, might also need to account for their decision on behalf of a spouse, as the Asia society might still value the rule, uh, uh, the, the, the value of uh, patriarchy. Okay, and uh, I will believe uh, several study on ta in Taiwan on gender difference in different uh, differences in utilization of aggressive uh, end of life care might confirm the gender differences that we found in this study. Uh, Ken in 2014 uh, study report that more men than women at the working age with terminal cancer receive uh, aggressive uh, end of life care. And Huang in 2015 study also found that uh, even among elderly, men are more likely to have aggressive uh, end of uh, life care than women. And the, the recent uh, uh, Co. 2015 also revealed that men uh, with the average uh, mean age 66 are more likely to have than women to undergo aggressive uh, uh, end of life care, such as being admitted to ICU and die in ICU within 30 days before death. So we believe that uh, uh, th this uh, situation might uh, explain or, or might confirm the phenomenon we just uh, uh, share with uh, you about gender differences. However, uh, the study has a serious uh, limitation. Uh, the first one is that the number of interviews, uh, its limit is only 80% of uh, uh, family members were interviewed. And the hypothetical uh, end of life decision might not reflect what is really happening in the real situation. And then we, leave, we believe the family dynamic needs to be examined in real uh, end of life context, especially uh, what uh, men know, uh, how men perceive uh, with the, their uh, end of life decision on behalf of uh, uh, parents and the spouse. And more study uh, need to be conducted with regard to uh, surrogate decision making in Taiwan. Okay, uh, so this is a, uh, about uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Chen, for your presentation. Um, I want to ask, there's a few questions for you, Professor Chen. Uh, okay. The first question was, I found that the different attitudes between genders resemble that of physicians and nurses in withdrawing life support. There are cases physician argues for prolonged life support while nurses feel it futile. How do you think about this resemblance? Uh, yes, uh, 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 I think uh, what, you are, what you are saying is very uh, uh, close to my uh, 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 information because uh, uh, nurses are more than uh, doctors tend to uh, uh, agree with the uh, uh, palliative care or you know uh, with, withdraw or withhold uh, LSD for terminal ill patient. Uh, this uh, resemblance, uh, uh, I cannot say this, uh, this uh, similarity uh, is uh, based on similar logic uh, uh, because in, when, uh, in, in, in the medical uh, context, it's more about uh, patient. It's not uh, their family member. So uh, uh, it, the logic is different, but nurses, um, uh, have more chances to have closer look about how patients suffered than, than physicians. So nurses 
they observe, they, you know, they have a real sense how patients suffer from uh, such an illness. So uh, out of uh, empathy, uh, I believe they, they, uh, more, uh, they tend to uh, uh, give the, uh, you know, advice that uh, they, they should uh, go to uh, palliative care or they should withdraw or withhold LSD. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Th there was another question just generally about your uh, participant uh, profile, if they're coming from uh, people you interviewed in ICU or in the medical setting, or is it coming from the community? Or uh, it's uh, coming from uh, uh, a hospital uh, like ICU and the surgical ward or a general ward. Uh, those uh, it, uh, respondents a family member of uh, inpatient, uh, you know, patient hospitalized in, uh, in ICU and, and the surgical ward. Because the reason we choose a family member of uh, uh, pay, uh, inpatient, I mean, hospi patient hospitalized in ICU or to surgical ward is because we believe uh, uh, it, because they have family member in the hospital and they might be uh, more aware of your, uh, of the PAA, or they might have uh, given more thought about uh, life's uh, LSD. So uh, that, that's the reason we uh, uh, select uh, respondents from uh, uh, clinicals, uh, not uh, community uh, site. Um. And maybe uh, the following questions, I may open it up to all the panelists, but just uh, as another question, Professor Chen, is mm -hmm. um, could you share more details about um, kind of the respondents from who are parents versus who are the, uh, the children of the patients? Um, uh, they, they may have different um, affections toward yes, the patients. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, because we, uh, when we ask the, uh, the respondent if they, uh, what, who are the close person, they will uh, most likely to make a surrogate decision. And they will give us, they will provide, uh, they will uh, likely to, pro uh, to make decision for parents, for spouse. Only three of the respondent report that they would, uh, uh, you know, likely to make a surrogate decision uh, for their children. So uh, in this study, we can we did not show the result, uh, you know, because only three uh, respondents report they that they would uh, uh, make a surrogate decision for children. But for the uh, the relationship between the patient and the family member uh, in this uh, data set, uh, uh, about one third are the pair, uh, the children, uh, you know, just 22% uh, uh, 20, of the uh, patient uh, are children, uh, children of those uh, respondents. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to open it up for, for everyone to uh, certainly have a discussion with the panelists. And I know earlier some, there was some chat that talked about uh, Professor Lee from Korea talked about one in 250 uh, recover from a vegetative state. Thanks for uh, sharing that information. And uh, there, was a, uh, there was a participant that talked about in Macau, there are very limited laws pertaining to Patient Autonomy Act and others, um, advanced care planning in Macau. Um, and certainly um, another question that was asked um, pertaining to advanced care planning was, um, is there some sort of a faith or religious influence in that? Uh, I'm wondering if one of you would like to contribute to that, respond to that question. 
Mm, okay. Okay, I'll try to answer a couple of questions raised by uh, the audience. And the first one is uh, how family influence. And because in our diet study, uh, the study of ACP uh, between uh, cancer patients and family, we find out that there's a high concordance uh, on the timing of initiating ACP. And uh, also there's a high concordance uh, between uh, their choosing of life sustaining treatment. And so basically, I think because, uh, you know, the Chinese and the Taiwanese culture, we don't openly discuss, sometimes we just discuss the issues in a very subtle way. So, um, well, uh, it, it's very difficult to define how we discuss it. But I think a more um, qualitative study probably can reveal uh, how, we, how we do that. And the second question is that, what's the uh, AD completion rate in our study and also in the actual clinical setting? Uh, from the an NTUH experience, I would say that uh, there's a high percentage of completion rate uh, as a result of the ACP consultation. Only one person uh, after, uh, only one person who didn't sign the AD after the ACP consultation, I would say the rate is very high. Of course, this is some kind of a, uh, selection bias because for those who have a uh, register for the uh, clinic are those who like to complete the AD. Uh, but uh, in, in actual clinical setting, if the physician um, uh, brings out the uh, ACP discussion suggestion, basically the patient will listen and they will consider. Okay? So uh, that's another question. What's the religious influence uh, on ACP? Yes, uh, there is a great influence who felt that for those who are in the traditional uh, Chinese religions, who prefer to take a more natural way, which means that they do not you know, prefer to use any life-sustaining treatment and who prefer not to use artificial hydration and nutrition at the end of life. Uh, these are some questions that I can think about. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, also, you know, thinking about certainly some questions also for Professor Sai, um, you know, how do we, who, who are some of the decision-making process, you know, in terms of uh, how do we certainly help to get the patient autonomy act or how do we get this information out to uh, so it's kind of fully kind of uh, implemented or how it can be fully uh, help uh, family members on the provider side. How do we better educate providers, but how do we better also better educate the community? Do you have any thoughts on kind of what the next steps could be or how do we better improve the education? Um, uh, okay, thank you, Winston, for your very important questions. I think from my perspective, uh, I have been participating in uh, the legislation process. I uh, actually present in a few uh, public hearings and also make some uh, like a short talk uh, concerning the uh, uh, ethical and the legal uh, uh, importance of such a law. So uh, actually in my presentation, I say that uh, I, I uh, say that uh, if you are competent adult, you are rational, you can make decision to refuse treatment. So uh, I think the patient right to autonomy act actually protect this. But it takes a lot of uh, preparation, okay, for the hospital staff to do this, for the uh, consultation, uh, for uh, helping people to understand uh, because it might be a very complicated situation process. And so uh, we know that uh, before the law was passed, uh, there has been lots of debates, even lots of resistance from the legal uh, society and even from the medical societies because uh, for the uh, law person, they think this is a right to kind of terminate life. Could that be kind of a suicide? And for the medical uh, people, uh, they actually uh, are worried about, okay, what if I need to conduct this? I must face uh, with the process of uh, withdrawing life support, uh, even uh, 
they would maybe uh, further request. So there has been lots of uh, discussion before the legislation. And the, this law uh, has a, a important characteristics. It actually imposed this kind of a consultation uh, responsibility to medical institutions. So you need to do, do ACP uh, under strict uh, requirement, such as in the hospital setting, you need to have a doctor, nurses, social worker, uh, psychologist to help with the consultation. And then you need to sign with a witness and then you need to register on your uh, national health ins insurance ID card to complete the AD. So this requirement uh, is imposed, uh, this obligation uh, that hospital must do this. So I know that because uh, the, the hospital system in Taiwan, you have this uh, medical center, you have regional hospital, and you have uh, community hospitals. But for these uh, regional and uh, community uh, hospital centers, uh, they have this responsibility to provide this. And also uh, from the medical professional uh, associations, for example, uh, a main force uh, should certainly from our uh, hospice and palliative care uh, medical association. But uh, not only them, uh, we also see that the, uh, the medical association of intensive care, internal medicine, and even the emergency medicine, uh, lots of medical associations because they need to uh, 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 manage this kind of consultation and they need to be in charge of this process and their hospital need to sign and document this uh, ID. So they need to fulfill their uh, responsibility. So uh, uh, over the past uh, two or three years, actually there's a uh, lots of education program. And also there's a, a patient right to, to autonomy, like the research center. It was founded uh, by uh, our former uh, party one member, uh, Yang Yuxin, okay. Uh, they also serve an important uh, institution in providing training for uh, seed teachers and uh, holding uh, training program and even give certifications. So I think at least from the uh, effort of our uh, medical societies and hospitals, they try to uh, fulfill their responsibility of their role in this law Okay, so I think there has been lots of uh, public communication and education. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to see if the audience, if there's any participants who wanted to contribute to this discussion. And then at the very end, I want to give each of the panelists perhaps you know, 30 seconds to a minute to give a last, if there's something last you wanted to highlight about uh, today's talk. So any participants um, wanted to speak, uh, this is the time. And if not, um, I want to give each of the panelists, uh, at least uh, what should we take home today, you know, from what we're learning today and um, one maybe just in the order of our presenters, perhaps Professor Xiao Yi Cheng, would you like to start? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sen. I think I would like to summarize by saying that uh, uh, the Patient Right to Autonomy Act, which actually uh, uh, gives the Taiwanese people uh, a way to ensure uh, the, uh, the right for themselves at the very terminal stage and um, uh, 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 and from our study, we find out that uh, uh, the ACP is quite different from that of the West. And we find out there is a relational autonomy component uh, in our uh, 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 ACP culture. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Professor Tsai? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Winston and Duan, for this uh, very uh, lively uh, uh, online conferences, and I, I find it a very uh, successful. I mean, we can hear people, and our planning actually works. My presentation focuses on uh, one challenge uh, issue ahead in Taiwan. Uh, although we have this uh, legal framework to help with the end of life care for many people, we know that there are still patients suffering from uh, 
permanent vegetative status or in a minimal consciousness status. And to decide whether to withdraw their life support is, of course, complicated and difficult. Uh, we, uh, we do see a lot of uh, prolonged life support uh, has been provided uh, maybe years, even decades for some people. Uh, but uh, after a long discussion, uh, maybe in the Western countries uh, court uh, debate, we know that uh, it might be uh, not for the best interest of these patients, okay, in that kind of status. So we need to find certain solution. Uh, of course, that, that is not for every people in PVS status, but for some, if the, the agreement uh, from the caregiver and also their medical uh, care team uh, do consider uh, and having consensus about uh, stopping uh, such kind of a prolonged life support, uh, there should be certain legal framework to allow such uh, 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 treatment to be discontinued. So that is the next challenge we are facing and also the issue I'm considering. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Professor Duanrong Chen. Okay, yeah. I want to thank uh, Xiao Yi and Daniel, you know, come to uh, this uh, online conference with, with us to uh, give us such a wonderful presentation about a, uh, a patient right to autonomy act uh, uh, in Taiwan. Indeed, uh, in our uh, study, we do find that uh, women seem to uh, uh, take take in more about the concept of a patient autonomy. However, uh, men seem to, uh, you know, uh, aware of or seem to have a not so good uh, knowledge of PAA. But however, in, in the uh, clinical, uh, you know, in the medical uh, things, like uh, uh, most of the uh, decision maker may go to uh, men, you know, uh, sons make decision for their parents. Uh, so uh, I would uh, consider that in the future, uh, we need to uh, promote uh, more uh, uh, about a patient right autonomy act and uh, uh, more about uh, more knowledge about it to male communication uh, because uh, uh, as I found out that uh, men seem to have a very negative view of the PAA. So uh, I think uh, in the future, uh, <clears throat> I would uh, li like to uh, put those, uh, go into the community and uh, make more uh, uh, communication about the PAA and uh, to more audience, not to just, uh, uh, you know, who, who people who are interested or who, who are just uh, uh, elderly. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you so much. I want to also finally mention that uh, coming up, we do have some wonderful uh, presentations uh, next week and the week after. And I wanted to share with you uh, a little bit about that. On September 26, sorry, September 16th, I'm sorry. Um, we do have uh, pre presenters who will present from Japan and Korea, including Professor K. Kamide, uh, about the factors associated with healthy longevity, focusing on medical and physical aspects of community dwelling peoples, uh, findings from the Sonic study, and also Professor Mai Kabayama, who will be presenting on the longitudinal study of social factors related to the loss of independence among older Japanese, and also Professor Ihak Lee who will from Korea who will present on advanced planning for life-sustaining treatment and medical treatment among the elderly population in South Korea. Um, we also will have additional presentations um, on September 23rd from uh, China and, and Mongolia. Um, and uh, looking forward to those presentations. Um, please keep that in mind coming up. We really appreciate you joining us today. And um, we will happy to share. Uh, looking forward for you to joining us coming up in the future. Uh, thank you for the presenters today. And thank you for the planners, the coordinators today for today's what wonderful webinar. We really appreciate it. And thank you for everybody for joining us today. Please take care. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.
uh, wisdom. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor Chen, Thank Professor Cheng, Professor Tai. Bye-bye. Please take care. Bye-bye.